show. I'm Brandon Martini, a commercial pilot and flight instructor. And I'm Carson Vasquez. I'm a private pilot. And you're listening to the Aviation Mentors Podcast, sponsored by Stratus Financial. So buckle up, because the Aviation Mentors are taking off. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Aviation Mentors Podcast. We're finally back in the groove of things after getting back from sun and fun. Uh, where Carson and I had fun uh, interviewing some people and meeting some of the uh, clients of Stratus and some of the partner schools. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to be back, though. I mean, I was out in Florida for like two weeks, and I think I'm going back again next week for another like five days. Um, by the way, Florida and everybody who's in Florida, I absolutely love your state. I feel like I'm already a resident considering I've been there like six, six weeks uh, out of the past four months. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually looking forward to going back. And I've never been to the Keys before. I'm going to Key Largo next. So that'll be kind of fun. I'm looking forward to that a lot, actually. Uh, today, we're actually going to be talking about something that every pilot has to deal with, uh, especially uh, student pilots. Uh, they have to face this, uh, getting your FA medical exam. Uh, so getting a medical is a breeze for most people. It's just an in-depth physical exam, but it's not so easy for everybody. So today we're going to talk about uh, the different types of medicals, uh, the different type of medicals you should get, uh, ones that are available to you after you've already had a medical, et cetera. So uh, Carson, what do you think about getting medicals? You know, I think getting a medical uh, is something pretty routine. It's something that pilots think about every six months to five years, really. So it's not not as common. Um, it can be pretty much any other doctor's appointment. And it's also something where there's a lot of gray areas, but also strict guidelines set by the FAA. So luckily, we have you here as a CFI to talk us through it. So, Brandon, what can you tell me about first, second, and third class medicals? Well, there is a first class, a second class, a third class. That's the first thing. <laughs> Um, and also there is basic med, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit today as well. So there's first class, second class, and third class medicals, and there's also basic med. So uh, I'm going to talk about kind of all three of those. First off, first class medical is something that typically airline pilots get, and you need those roughly six months to a year. And then a second class medical is something that you need that's either one to two years. And a third class medical uh, is something that you need if you're just flying for fun, and that can be anywhere from two to five years. So it really depends on which medical you need and what you need it for. So if you're an airline pilot, uh, you probably need a first class medical. Actually, not probably. You do for sure. If you are a person who wants to fly for hire, you need a second class medical. And if you just want to fly for fun, all you need is a third class. So it really kind of depends. I would say if that you're looking to be an airline pilot and you're starting flight training, just go get your first class medical immediately. Uh, that way you just know you have you have it. And I know Stratus Financial requires all the borrowers to have a first or second class medical prior to, uh, to loan documents even being sent out. So that's how much it matters. I mean, it could really ground you or delay your career. Uh, so make sure that you, you get probably a first or second if you definitely want to become a career pilot. And just go get the third if, if you're not needed um, to be a career pilot and you just want to go fly for fun. That's what I had for many years. Now I get a first class medical. Um, even though I'm not flying for an airline or anything, but, uh, I still get a first class now and, but I only had third up until recently, I think. Yeah. And one thing that we, uh, we tell a lot of students is if you're going to become an airline pilot, or you think that there's some potential in the future that you're going to go and become an airline pilot or fly for hire, go for the first class right away. Uh, that should be the first medical you ever get it should be your first class medical and not because you're actually going to use the privileges with it. Uh, but because you want to make sure you're able to actually obtain that before you spend eighty to a hundred thousand dollars in flight training, you want to make sure that you're actually able to become an airline pilot medically before you go and do all that training. So there are some things that can keep you from getting a medical or especially delay you from getting a medical. So what kind of things can really do that for you, Brandon? Well, there's quite a few things that can that can kind of delay you from getting a medical or stop you from getting a medical. It really depends on how persistent you are, kind of like everything in life, really. If you give up, people give up on uh, things all, all the time. And it's not, a, it's not a good practice. If you start something, finish it, right? At least that's what I, I tell Austin, my son, uh, all the time. So I make sure he finishes whatever he starts, even if he hates it. <laughs> but the, kind of the biggest thing and kind of the most common is if you get a DUI uh, or you've got arrested when you were a, a younger person uh, or a wet reckless or, or something that's, that can impair your ability to fly an airplane uh, or or drive a car can also impact you on getting a medical certificate. And although a DUI or something like that is not necessarily a medical thing, uh, the FAA looks at it like, like it is because you have, you could have a, a pattern of substance abuse or something like that. But actually it's something that's very easily overcame. 
So if you want to become an airline pilot, if you have a DUI, that might be very difficult to get a job long term, just an FYI. Um, so that could be kind of a, a factor that stops you from some of your dreams. So the first thing you should do is try not to get a DUI, obviously. Don't drink and drive, which is very smart. And, uh, and obviously, don't drink and fly. That would be very, very smart. Um, but if you do have one and you still want to become a pilot, um, you can still get one, usually. Uh, you just have to jump through a few more hoops, and it kind of depends on your blood alcohol content at the time of your arrest and all sorts of things. So I would still pursue a pilot certificate. It's a lot of fun, and you can still get one. It just takes a little bit extra time and extra money and extra effort. Also, um, medications, if you're on certain types of medications, and if you've ever been on an antipsychotic medication, uh, those can really affect you, and it, they make you jump through a, a ton of hoops. So if you have ever had a history of depression or something like that where you've taken medication for it, that will delay your medical. Uh, but if you can show to the FAA that uh, it's no longer needed, and some medicines are, are actually okay to be on, but if you can show that it's no longer needed uh, and you've recovered and you're in a, a better place nowadays, et cetera, then you can normally get, uh, get that taken care of. Another one is diabetes. And I know just in the recent few years, they started uh, proving pilots that have diabetes before they didn't at all. Um, so I'm really happy they are doing that for, for pilots who have diabetes uh, nowadays. Uh, and the other one is colorblindness. A lot of pilots are colorblind or partially colorblind. Um, when you first get a medical, they can actually issue the medical with a night restriction on it. So you're not allowed to fly at night. Um, but Carson, I know, I know you've talked about some things. What's a way that you can actually get that, that, that restriction removed? So you're actually able to go to your local FISDO and go and talk to them and say, hey, I have this colorblind restriction. Um, I'm not able to fly at night solo, but I'd like to get this restriction removed. And they're going to send one of their inspectors up with you and one of their examiners, and you're going to fly a plane together, and they're going to do uh, ask the tower for light gun signals. And if you're able to test the light gun signals and you can see the difference between the red and green ones, uh, then you're actually able to see the light and gun signals at night, the taxi lights, the landing lights, um, and you know, the nav lights on other planes at night. So you're actually able to get that restriction removed, which is pretty cool. Yep, that's the best way to go about it, for sure. Um, now, I told you that you have to kind of not necessarily fight with the FAA, but work with the FAA long term to get this medical. And the way that you should go about that is you should go to AOPA. Um, that's the Air, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. They're a fantastic organization. Uh, they don't sponsor our podcast. I just like them. Uh, if anybody from that organization is listening, we'll take you on as a sponsor because we like you so much. So come on down. Um, but really, they support student pilots immensely. Uh, the first six-month membership with them is free as a student pilot. So go sign up for them. It's free for you right away. Go do that immediately. There's nothing to tell you you shouldn't go, uh, go sign up with them. Uh, if you have any problems with a medical, you can call up AOPA and you can actually ask them for help and advice on the medical. So before you go in and get your medical and apply for it, uh, you have to do a couple things. You have to go to a website called MedExpress. When, before you get a medical, you got to fill that out with all your medical history. And after you click submit, then you have to set up a doctor's appointment with a FAA medical examiner. Uh, so make sure that you've, if you have anything that's that's colorful in your medical history, then make sure you talk to AOPA uh, in the, in, before you go, go to the doctor or even before you fill out uh, the MedExpress application. I think that would be a really big one for you. So, Brandon, what happens if I actually get denied for my medical? Yeah, so uh, a denial is rare. Um, like I said, most of the time it's just deferred, right? Um, but you can be denied, so to speak. Um, but first off, Something like 98% of people who go for medical will get it if you jump through all the hoops and you spend the money that the FAA is requesting you to do. So go through all the hoops, make sure you jump through them, make sure you do what they say. Um, the likelihood of, of getting denied is very low, but the likelihood of getting deferred is fairly high um, if you have any questionable things in your history. So make sure that you follow whatever the FAA is telling you to do over time. And it's usually every two to three months, they'll send you a letter and say, hey, I need this, or hey, I need this, so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind and keep on moving um, through their process. Um, it's very unlikely that you get fully denied. There's very few people who do. Um, just go through their process and get it done. Uh, but be prepared. If you do get deferred, which is what, what most of the time you get, 
um, if you don't walk out of there with a medical certificate, obviously. Um, it can take anywhere from three months to a year. And everybody who I talk to who gets deferred, it probably is going to take a year. Uh, the FAA doesn't hire enough people. The budget's not high enough from the government. Uh, and they're the government. They act really slow. Um, they don't answer the phone calls over there. They don't do anything. So make sure that you are being persistent with this. And don't just give up after you get deferred. Go through the process and you will get it. Um, it just might delay your career by a year or something like that. But just know that it's still possible and stay excited for it because you're going to be a pilot one day and it's going to be fantastic. And I know Carson, we've talked about first, second, and third class kind of throughout this, uh, but you were going to talk about something else. And I think that's basic med. Carson, what is basic med? How do you use it? Who's it for? Talk to me about it because I know it's relatively new, but it is a required item um, on like the first section of the ACS for even private pilots. So I know it's important to the FAA. Um, so that's why I wanted to make sure we we touch on it today. And whenever I've done stage checks and end of courses and things like that, I always bring it up. And almost all the students never know enough about basic med, but it's because they're not going to be using it. And I understand it. And they're probably young, young kids. They're in their teens and early 20s. They're not going to be using it. Um, so I understand the reason why they don't know it that well, but it's still in the ACS, so you need to know it. Uh, so tell us about basic med, Carson. So basic med is a pretty cool thing that FAA came up with. I think it was FAA and AOPA that kind of lobbied for it. And they brought up a solution to pilots losing their medical uh, when they get to an older age. So the solution was basic med. And basic med is basically a third class medical, but with a bunch more restrictions on it. And the restrictions are everything from can't fly an aircraft, uh, which has a weight of 6,000 pounds or more for takeoff weight. And you can't fly a plane with more than six occupants. So that includes yourself, uh, so yourself and five passengers. You can fly up to 18,000 feet, but not above it. And you can't fly faster than 250 knots, but you can fly VFR or IFR uh, with basic med. And to go and get your basic med, you have to fill out this checklist, which you can find on AOPA's website or the FAA's website. Just Google AOPA basic med and it'll take you right to it. And the checklist is called the Basic Med FAA Comprehensive Medical Examination Checklist, the CMEC. So you take this self-evaluation, you fill it out, then you go to see your doctor, just a normal physician, any doctor can do it, and have them fill out their half of it, just give you a physical. Then after going and seeing your doctor, you complete an online course, print that out as well, and then keep that plus your Basic Med form in your logbook from your CMEC, and that compiles together to make your basic med and keep current with it. You only have to go see your doctor every four years and complete the online course every two years. So it's helpful, especially for pilots above 40, when your medical doesn't last as long as it used to. (laughs) And you get to keep this medical for pretty much four years and only do that course every two years, which makes it really easy to keep a medical. And there is another cool thing. Um, Basic med is not the only way to keep flying. So people that have their flight instructor rating are actually able to fly without a medical, right, Brandon? Yeah, absolutely. So CFIs, um, I wanted to throw this in there today, even though it doesn't really have to do specifically with medicals, but it does have to do with your instructor who may or may not have one. And instructors are not required to have medicals. I would say most instructors I know, um, at least the younger instructors, they probably have first or second class. Some of them have third class um, or they have a first class with third class uh, privileges, um, which I'll get into in a second as well. But flight instructors are actually not required to have a medical as long as they're not acting as PIC, pilot in command of the airplane. So if you have an instructor who doesn't have a medical, they can only do basically instrument rating and up because you're the PIC in that airplane at, at all times. So you're actually not required. I, and if they do want to teach, uh, they want to teach private pilot, they can actually have basic med as well. So they can teach with basic med because uh, the FAA looks at an instructor as as an instructor and not as a pilot. So that's also why you don't have to have a first or second class medical because you're not acting as a commercial pilot. You're acting as an instructor, uh, which is very different. That's even why the FAA gives you a new piece of plastic when you get your new pilot certificate. They actually give you a new pilot certificate that's called an instructor uh, certificate, which is not a pilot certificate. So that is something that's a little bit different. Um, and the last thing I want to kind of touch on before we wrap it up for the day is, is that there are different classes of medical certifications, like we talked about, first, second, and third class. Now, if you get a first class, 
um, it's going to it's going to last a certain period of time, um, and then it goes to a second class, and then it and then it can go to a third class, and it really kind of depends on on how old you are. And you can actually look that up. There's a nice little chart on uh, on in the FARS. Uh, it's in sixty one uh, decimal two three for medical certificates requirement and duration. So if you want to know all about them without me boring you and reading each and every section, then you can kind of look it up. Uh, but most medical certificates start off as whatever class they start off and they, and they degrade over time. So if you're over 40, for example, you can get a first class medical. It'll last, it'll be a first class for six months. Then it'll be a second class for six months. Uh, and then it'll go to a third class for the following year. And then it expires if you're over 40. And uh, for an ex- another example, if you are under 40 and you get a first class, it'll be good for uh, one year. And then it kind of goes to a second class and then it goes to a third class for the remainder. Um, so it kind of it kind of depends on your age and what class. But go ahead and check out 6123 and look up the, uh, the medical uh, certificates. But remember, if you do get a first class medical, it's always a first class medical for all five years if you're under 40, except you lose the first class privileges. So uh, it will just turn into third class privileges. So that's always a kind of a got me or a got you on uh, on check rides. Um, and for some reason, DPs like to mess with people on that particular question. But it's it's always a first class, and the privileges get reduced to third class privileges, um, which just means you can't fly for hire. So it's just a sticky situation on how you word it. But go ahead and look at sixty one twenty three. It'll really get you into it. Well, I was doing my stage check with Brandon. He asked me that question. He says, what happens to your first class medical after a year? I said, it becomes a second class medical. Hand me your medical. So I handed him my medical and he looked at it and said, oh, okay, first class medical. And then he started waving his hand in front of it. They said, it's been a year. Is it magically a second class medical? <laughs> He's like, read the words. It still says first class medical. So it's still a first class medical, but with second or, or third class privileges after that. <laughs> I, I remember doing that now. Yeah, I literally acted like I was a magician. I put my hand in and I like waved it in front of it like I was Houdini. <laughs> and I was like, did it magically change? I was like, nope, because I'm not a magician. Um, it was a fun, it was a fun, um, fun day. I haven't done that with any students for a really long time, but I don't know. Now I kind of want to again. <laughs> that was, that was a lot of fun. And by the way, it does not turn to a second class, Carson. It turns into a third class. Um, but I digress. So thank you everybody for uh, listening today. We really appreciate it. Hope you learned something about medicals. Um, I know we talked a lot about them and uh, um, there's even more. I mean, we could probably go for another 30 minutes on like getting in depth into medicals. That's why I just referenced 6123. Um, They spell it out there pretty well for you. You know, I might not have remembered exactly the lesson, but I still remember the gist of it. It doesn't magically become something else. So going back to what we're talking about, going to get your medical is really just another doctor's appointment. And it is still best practice to know you don't have any medical problems before you go get your medical, or even better, if you figure that out before you go and fill out MedExpress even. So if you don't, getting a denied medical is going to follow you around for your whole aviation career. And that's not something that any of us want to happen. So make sure you get everything figured out before you go and start the medical process. 100%. Yeah. Make sure you go hit up AOPA, become a, a free member for six months. And ask them your medical questions before you even fill out MedExpress and go to the doctor. It's probably the best advice I can give you out of this whole episode if you don't currently have a medical and you are a student pilot. And for the flight instructors listening who are newer flight instructors who um, who haven't heard that before, please tell your students that. It, will, uh, it can change their life for the good or for the bad, depending on which route they go. And uh, the AOPA route is, is not a bad one whatsoever. Uh, as always, you can reach out to either one of us at uh, Twitter or Instagram. For me, it's at Mr. Martini Guy. For Carson, it's at Carson underscore AV17. And as we always prefer, please reach out to us via email. Uh, for me, it's Brandon at AviationMentors.com and Carson at AviationMentors.com for him. And uh, please reach out to us. If you want to hear any episodes on any certain topics, please let us know. Uh, we're always looking for new topics and uh, we've got a, about 30 or 40 of them uh, more ready to go. But there's always things that certain people want to hear. So let's uh, let us know. And we're really happy to talk about them. Yeah. Thanks for listening today, everybody. And as a wrap up for the day, remember, we're here to guide you in your aviation journey. So fly safe and enjoy the ride. <laughs>